One point in time they had you um, blindfolded in the back of a car, being taken to a location, had your phone taken off you. You had your, your great cover story, but I could see a couple of potential hole, holes in it, uh, working in, in that in, environment. Um, how how'd you feel in those, those situations? Because you really were rolling the dice there. They always put a bag over your head. You know, <laughs> they always think, I'm driving through the jungle. Do you really think I'm going to remember one dirt road from another? Yeah. Uh, they, you know, they take your phone point. off I haven't, you. I haven't thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the um, they always take your phone off you as well, I guess, because you do have GPS, and that's you know one thing that concerns them. You know that there there will be a store, a, you know, a GPS marker that shows where you were. Um, but yeah, and I was with the guy at that point who was you know Michael, who'd been my translator and been my sort of link into a lot into a lot of these um, new relationships and and gangs. We'd, we'd built up quite a friendship, Michael and I. So I trusted Michael and I think he trusted me. Um, he was nervous. I could tell he was nervous. Um, he had a fa- he had a young family. And I I wonder if he was starting to, to wonder why he'd gotten himself into this. Um, but I think at that point it had become, I'd, I'd, it had become like a dog at a bone. I just, I wanted to see an operational meth lab and I just wasn't going to leave until until I could. Um, and we tried several times, um, a couple of times we, I got very close to getting into a meth lab and it, it wasn't actually the criminals that the people cooking who, be, who were the obstacle, it was the police, the secret police. Yeah. Like a couple of times I got so close and then it was the, the secret police turned up and like, they're following me and I can't shake them off because they've spotted that there's a Westerner somewhere where there, there shouldn't be a Westerner. And now they're following me around. And so the guys are like, well, until you, until you lose your secret police mates, we're not going to show you where the meth lab is. Yeah. So it finally actually got to a place uh, where I wasn't being followed and where someone was prepared to kind of show me. As it turned out, I, I wasn't allowed to go into the lab. I was allowed to go into the jungle to, you know, to an area close to where the lab was. Michael was allowed to go into the lab and he was allowed to film within the lab and come, and he was allowed to show me the video of the lab. Uh, so I took that as kind of as close as I was going to get yeah. and having really tried, I mean, this is months and months and months and months of trying. I just had to accept, well, you know, this is, this is good enough for me. Um, so he disappeared off. He came back absolutely terrified. I think he thought they were going to execute him. Um, he showed me the, the, you know, the video and I could see absolutely everything from the video um, to answer all the questions that I'd had, you know, how sophisticated it was, uh, the operational level, the number of people involved, you know, all of those sort of details that I'd been I'd been asking questions about for months. Suddenly, I could kind of see for myself. And the the scale of it. Yeah, so they were they were knocking out, um, you know, runs of what 10, 20, 30 kilos at a time. They're probably able to produce like hundred kilos in a week. Um, so you know, very quickly you get up to a ton. The I kind of expected it to be, you know, maybe a group of guys standing over a pot, you know, stirring it with a stick. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it, yeah, in, in the jungle. I mean, it was in the jungle, but that that was the only thing that was rudimentary about it. It was state of the art, brand new industrial equipment, which I guess makes sense because China's just over the border, and that's where all of that industrial equipment is being produced, right? Yeah. So they're, they're bringing it over the the Chinese the Chinese border, which is not a porous border. Let's be honest. So whoever's letting that equipment come over knows exactly why it's coming over. Um, but yeah, you're talking about like big chrome cylinders, loads of generators. Um, you know, all of this meth is being cooked, you know, in sealed units under pressure. We're talking about industrial size um, sacks of precursors, you know, that are being brought in off the back of, you know, big 20 ton lorries. Um, you know, a, a considerable operation uh employing i don't know 20 or 30 people and those people are on annual contracts so they're brought into the jungle you're not allowed to go home you're not allowed to leave so, you're not so allowed to speak to anyone people know it's know it's happening and as you said like the yeah. borders are not porous so people are aware it's going on and it's being condoned at some level by by some group that uh yeah no obviously, i mean you know people who say oh well the border's very porous and things can get through and I, I don't believe that i don't believe the chinese border is very porous 
You know, I don't think there's large numbers of migrants or drugs or guns or anything else finding their way in and out of China without the the Chinese Communist Party yeah. knowing about and it. You, so you said around there, like the secret police following you too. Like people know what's going yeah. on. It's, uh, yeah, people know people know what's going on. But I think you know the secret police can only follow you so far. Once you cross one of the battle lines, you know, once you're into if you, you know you leave the area that's controlled by the I mean, the government is the army in Myanmar. It's the same thing. Mm. But once you leave one of the controlled areas and you're into one of the ethnic armed groups areas, you know, you're into the you're into war state, for example, the secret police can't go that far. You know, then you're into the that area is completely controlled by the war army. Yeah. Um, and so, but then you have to say, well, there's no way, and there's no way someone's cooking tons of meth here unless the war army know about it because we're in their territory so whoever's territory you're in the people that are running that territory definitely know what's going on it's, it, it would be impossible it, it, it makes, for it to operate any uh, other way sense. you you yeah. raised the name michael and i just want to raise this because i i, I read it and checked myself when uh, i read it and uh, his father and uh, jump in if i i'm miss uh representing the story his father was involved in a situation where the uh the army and the rebels and uh, he had to the army got hold of michael's father and he had to identify where the rebel stronghold was or where the rebels were based through you know various um interrogation techniques and michael said uh, they ate my father yeah and they ate you, him. You i thought, thought that you thought i thought he'd mistranslated yeah i thought i'd misunderstood and he mistranslated um, yeah, this is pretty gruesome. I no one's listening to this over their breakfast, but he's um his yeah, his father was the headman in the village. The rebels came into the village and demanded that they be hidden. He hid them. Then the army came in and tortured him and he had to give up their position. And so the rebels that managed to escape came back. They were pretty angry at him and they took him into the jungle and tied him to a tree. And then um Michael said they cut out part of his like his heart. Um, while he was tied to a tree and they ate it in front of him, you know, as to send a message to other headmen in the village that there was only one side that they better be on. Yeah. You know, it's, it's it's a brutal, brutal civil war that's going on out there when people are, you know, doing things like that. 